is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, appreciate that, Speaker. Good morning. My first question is uh, to the Premier. Uh, Dr. Brooke Fallis, the respected head of William Osler's critical care department in Brampton, was fired from his position back in January of 2021. Uh, the Premier was asked by media about his calls of complaint to the then CEO uh, about uh, Dr. Fallis's tweets. Uh, at the time, on uh, February 2, 2021, uh, the Premier said, and I quote uh, regarding these calls, 100% false, and it just didn't happen. However, recordings released by W5 uh, clearly show uh, that perhaps the, uh, uh, this is not, in, in fact, what happened. They show otherwise, Speaker. So my question is, does the Premier still stand behind those statements today, considering that W5's evidence uh, is clearly contrary to what the uh, Premier claimed? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Speaker, at the time of his claims, neither my office nor the office of the Premier had ever heard of this individual, and his claims remain categorically false. In fact, William Osler has already publicly acknowledged that at no time has the Premier's office ever given any direction or advice relating to health human resources at the hospital. Since the onset of the pandemic, our office has and has continued to rely upon the advice given by the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Moore, and by his advisors with respect to actions that uh, they recommended be taken during the course of the pandemic, and no one else. Supplementary question. A speaker, yesterday the Minister of Health made the exact same claim that they had, quote, never heard of him. But W5's FOI documents show the exact opposite, Speaker. And the recording that was taken uh, of the CEO of William Osler Health System, Dr. Uh, Naveed Mohammed, on November 16th of 2020, confirms that, and I quote, I've been warned a number of times that these guys in the government have a very, very long memory. These guys remember. That's the first thing we are afraid of. The first thing we're afraid of Order. is what Dr. Mohammed was saying. He also said that uh, he said on this same recording that the premier of this province had called him multiple times. Question. So the question is, does the premier still stand by his claim that, that none of this happened, that he didn't call the CEO of Wil William Osler Health System multiple times in November of 2020? Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, the Premier may have spoken with the CEO of the hospital, but they would have been about medical issues, pandemic-related issues, not to comments made by someone that none of us had ever heard of. As the leader of the official opposition may recall, there were many doctors in many locations had lots to say about the pandemic. However, no action was ever taken against them because they are entitled to their opinion. However, the opinions that this government relied upon were the opinions of Dr. Wi Dr. Williams and then Dr. Moore and the other official advisors to our government. Final supplementary. Uh, well, Speaker, hospital officials told Dr. Fallis that they were worried that they were worried funding for other important health initiatives and projects would be at risk. They were feeling intimidated apparently, and threatened, apparently. The hospital chief of staff, Dr. David Bortz, uh, in fact, told Dr. Fallis on November the, 20, uh, the 16th, 2020, and I quote, that's how these guys play the game. And whether you like it or not, they are the paymasters. These guys can be nasty in a way that you don't even know they're being nasty. This is what they're saying about the government, about the premier of this province, Speaker. So why would the chief uh, of staff of the hospital believe the premier and his government, the paymasters, are being nasty if it wasn't because of phone calls from the premier to the CEO of William Osler? The Minister of Health. There is no reason for anyone to have felt intimidated because there were no actions ever taken. There were no discussions. Order. And William, 
Osler has already publicly acknowledged that there was no direction, no advice, none whatsoever by the Premier of the province. And none of us had ever even heard of this person until he came forward with his allegations. As I said before, those allegations are categorically false, and the only advice that we have relied upon is the advice from Dr. Moore and his advisors, and that will continue to remain the same. My next, next question, thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. Well, maybe the Minister of Health might want to consider the fact that they're still afraid of what the government might do, which is why they're perhaps saying that these things didn't happen. But look, Dr. Fallis said very clearly in his latest interview that after he tweeted, after he tweeted about the pandemic on November 5th, and I quote, the CEO had received a phone call from Doug Ford, who was upset about what I was saying publicly. That's what Dr. Fallis said. Multiple hospital officials said the exact same thing, Speaker. The hospital felt such political pressure that they hauled Dr. Fallis into a Zoom meeting over his tweets. They told him they were afraid, that these guys were nasty. They said the Premier had been calling. My question is, why would all of these people make this stuff up? Minister of Health. I have absolutely no idea because there were no communications. The, while the Premier may have spoken with the, uh, the with Dr. Mohammed, it would have been about issues relating to the pandemic, not about actions or tweets given by a certain individual. That is not something that the Premier concerned himself with. He concerned about the health and safety of the people of Ontario, Order. and that is why. We continue to rely on the advice of Dr. Moore and his advisors, the people at the public health measures tables and other places, to give our government advice, which has served us very well given the state that we're in right now. We have relied on Dr. Moore's advice and will continue to do so because he and advisors know what they're talking about. Well, Speaker, on November 5, 2020, Dr. Fallis was told that the Premier of Ontario called the head of the hospital, of his hospital, to complain about his tweets. Dr. Fallis then got a, cis, a cease and desist letter. He got a cease and desist letter from his hospital to stop tweeting. Yet the government, the Premier, denies that any of this even happened. The question here is about the character of our Premier, the character of this Premier and what he order. himself has done. So my question is, why would the entire leadership of this hospital believe that they needed to muzzle Dr. Fallis? That's what they believed. They needed to muzzle Dr. Fallis, fearing for their funding, feeling, fearing that their funding would be at risk question. if there wasn't any political pressure at all to do so. It does not make sense, Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, listen to what the Leader of the Opposition is saying. She was saying that we were so upset that we wanted to take action. But you're right. We did take action. So what we did was we delivered a brand new hospital for Brampton, Mr. Speaker. We were so angry that we decided we're going to give them a medical school in Brampton, Mr. Speaker. We were so frustrated that we said, why don't we give them better GO train service in Brampton? Mr. Speaker, we were so angry, we said, let's send them millions of dollars more for long-term care in their area, Mr. Speaker. What we were angry about is the complete failure of the Liberals and NDP to ever deliver anything for Brampton, Mr. Speaker. Anything for Brampton. Zero. 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 And that is what we have been doing since day one, isn't it, colleagues? We've been delivering for the people of Brampton every single day, including, including, including a new hospital, long-term care, better education, better roads, transit, transportation. Mr. Speaker, a medical school, a university. I think that's delivering for Brampton. She should get on board and work with us. Yeah. Deliver more. Yeah. Yeah. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's very clear what the Premier of this province should do is admit what he did back in November of 2020 and come clean with the people of Ontario. That's what he should do. Everyone knows how this Premier handled the pandemic. Speaker, Hundreds of thousands of people contracted COVID-19. Thousands and thousands of people lost their lives. Doctors speaking out against this government's terrible pandemic response should be heard. 
They should be heard, not fired, Speaker. Hospital CEOs should never have to worry that the Premier's vengeance is going to threaten their funding. So my question is, will the Premier do the right thing? Will he just come clean? Will he apologize to Dr. Fallis, to the William Osler Health System, to Ontarians? And not only should he apologize, but we're also asking that he promise question. to never, ever threaten the funding the health care funding of a hospital because he's unhappy, because he wants to muzzle critics. And the government has Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, what the Leader of the Opposition is doing is really highlighting her failure. Her failure. I think uh, what it look, this is a member who had who had who held the balance of power between 2011 and 2014. Did they do anything to help Brampton? No. They sent it on stretch goals for insurance, and what did they accomplish? Nothing, Mr. Speaker. Nothing, Mr. Speaker. So what have we accomplished? A brand new hospital for the people of Brampton, Mr. Speaker. Of course, now they voted against that. They voted against it, Speaker. A brand new university for Brampton. How do they vote? Against, against it, Mr. Speaker. Millions of dollars in long-term care. How do they vote? Against. against it, Mr. Speaker. We've seen auto insurance rates come down in Brampton. How do they vote? No. Against it, Mr. Speaker. When you talk about the pandemic, there is no jurisdiction in North America that has done better Response? than the province of Ontario because of the hard work of this Minister of Health, this Premier, Mr. Speaker, and this caucus who have never failed in supporting the people of the province of Ontario and especially the people of Brampton. Stop the clock. The House will come to order. Please restart the clock. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Ontario has finally signed on to the federal government's $10 a day child care plan at the 11th hour. Going to ask the government side not to do that again. And ask the Minister of Energy to come to order. I warn the Minister of Energy. Order. Please restart the clock. Member for Park Tell High Park has the floor. But will parents actually have a spot for their child? Experts say Ontario's target should be expanded by at least 150,000 spaces to keep up with the increased demand. The Premier boasts that he will create 86,000 new childcare spaces, but, Speaker, that includes 15,000 spaces that were already created and 22,000 that are already in process. So the reality is it's only 50,000 new spaces, a third of the bare minimum Ontario needs. My question to the Premier is, what will you say to the families when there are no childcare spaces for their children? Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, unlike the members opposite, we didn't sign the first deal. We signed a better deal for the people yeah. of Ontario. And we are proud to stand in this province for the interests of families, securing a $13.2 billion, $3 billion more than what was initially offered, an additional year of funding commitment, and yes, 86,000 new spaces so that we can create access and affordability. We can finally make childcare affordable for Ontario families. Mr. Speaker, under this plan, there will be a 25 percent reduction on average retroactive to April. We will achieve 50 percent, a net cut to one of the most expensive childcare systems in Canada by Christmas of this year, and yes, we will finally deliver 
$10 a day daycare by year 2025. It is a positive deal for families. It will deliver immediate relief. It Response? will increase access and support our recovery as we move forward from this pandemic. Mr. Speaker, we're proud to work with the federal government to deliver a good deal for Ontario hey, families. Hey. Speaker, I can't believe the minister is feeling pride for being the last province in the country to sign the deal. Even if the government had done their job and planned to create enough spaces, they still haven't done the work to ensure that those spaces can be staffed. To recruit and retain childcare workers, you have to pay them properly. After years of neglecting these workers with low pay and poor working conditions, Ontario has a childcare workforce shortage. Other provinces committed to a wage grid for workers. Without doing the same in Ontario, we will be in the same childcare crisis we've endured for decades. Why didn't this government commit to a wage grid and other basic improvements for childcare workers? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, under our plan, under this progressive Conservative government and our Premier's leadership, we are finally cutting childcare fees for Ontario families. This year alone, families will save on average $4,000. That number will rise to over $12,000 in the year 2023. These are significant savings at a critical time, an inflection point of our economy, trying to restart our economy and move it forward. And to do so, to ensure women could re-enter the economy and labor, enter the labour market, to ensure that families could not have to make the choice between childcare and going to work. This is good for the economy. This is good for women. It is good for all families. We should celebrate this progress as a parliament because what we have done today, working across party lines, interprovincial leadership, working with the federal government to achieve something that families have dreamt of for decades, which is affordable childcare and access in communities across Ontario. The next question, the member for Flamborough, Glanbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning. And my question morning. is also to the Minister of Education. Great Speaker, news. in the province of Ontario, child care costs rose to unacceptable highs during the Wynne Del Duca era. When we came to government, our government faced some of the highest child care costs in the entire country. The Del Duca Wynne legacy of scarcity and unaffordability left many families in Ontario without child care. But over the past few months, the Premier and the Premier Order. and the government have negotiated continuously with the federal government to land the right child care deal for Ontario families. Recognizing the unique composition of Ontario's child care system, can the Minister of Education tell us how this government secured Question. a more affordable and sustainable child care deal for Ontario families? Minister of Education. Thank you. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Flamborough Granbrook for her leadership in this parliament, rep representing the people of her community well, demanding that the federal government steps up their investment. And in this deal, we have achieved that with more flexibility, a sustainable program in funding that actually gets us to end dollars. The contrast between the Liberal Party and the Progressive Conservatives is that you would have accepted the first agreement. Member for Ottawa South, come to order. Demonstrably, would not have got to ten dollars a day by year 2025. That just is a matter of fact. So much so that the federal Liberals accepted that premise, and they allowed us to take five years of funding and allocated in four years to increase the per-year investment by $600 million to get to $10. Now, Mr. Speaker, what we have done is we have preserved parental choice. We respect that parents make the best decision how to raise their kids. It's why we Response. fought to ensure inclusion for for-profit childcare. We fought to ensure more money's on the table, a longer deal, a good deal for the people of this province. Yeah, yeah. Under supplementary. Thank you. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for working tirelessly to get this great deal what for great Ontario minister. families. <laughs> Speaker, members of the opposition have often tried to pressure this government into signing any deal for Ontario families, but we know that children and parents in this province deserve a deal that will make childcare more affordable for decades to come, here, here. ensuring a long-term sustainable deal that reflects the heavy investments already made by this province in child care is essential. The opposition kept asking the government to sign the first deal available. So, Speaker, will the Minister of Education tell this House what he was able to secure for Ontario families by holding firm and standing up for Ontario families? Yeah, yeah. Minister of Education. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I mean, what we believe in this parliament and this party as progressive conservatives is to protect parental choice. And what we have done, what no province has done, is protect for profit and non profit child care for parents to choose where they send their kids to be uh, provided with care. We've also ensured a longer duration of a deal. The only province in this federation to secure six years of investment, $2.9 billion more added to this deal, and complete flexibility to move the dollars year over year to where it counts to get the $10. This is a monumental step forward when it comes to financial relief for the people we serve. Mr. Speaker, $4,000 of average savings this year, $12,000 by year 2023, $10 by year 2025. 86,000 more spaces, 14,000 more EC workers. Response. Together, we are restoring hope, we are providing relief, and we're getting our economy back on track. Yeah. Next question, the member for Nickelbell. Thank you for the Premier. Speaker, the government has tried to eliminate the regulatory college of the traditional medicine, Chinese medicine, with Bill 88. When thousands of Ontarians rose up in opposition to this short-sighted move, the government backed down and said they would work with the college to address the concerns that they had heard. But the government has not appointed enough members to the board of the college for the college to actually be able to carry out the tasks that are needed, the tasks that the government said are needed. When will the government appoint members to the Board of Director of the College of Traditional Chinese Medicine Practitioners and Acupuncturists so that they can fulfill their mission. Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for the question. It is very important to many people, and we, you will know our government is working to try and get more people working by reducing regulatory barriers to support individuals who do practice traditional Chinese medicine. And one of the problems in the past was that many people were not able to write the exam in English or asking to be able to write it in Chinese. That is something that we agree with and that is something that we are moving towards. We are moving forward with these appointments and I would expect that we will have people in place within the next very short while in order to deal with this issue to allow more people to practice traditional Chinese medicine and for people to access it across the province. Supplementary. The people practicing traditional Chinese medicine in Ontario need commitment from this government to ensure that their title is protected and that their skills are recognized. People like Anne from St. Jacob said, and I quote, it is also important to me for Chinese and acupuncture practitioners to be regulated by a reputable overseeing body, a college. Knowing that they are being held accountable to a college, I'm confident in receiving treatment. Otherwise, I likely would not be willing to use these services. Speaker, these reg registered health professionals are also small business owners, businesses who need reassurance to be able to operate. What assurance? Will the minister give us that enough member will be appointed to the board of the College of Traditional Chinese Medicine Practitioners and Acupuncturists before the June election Question. to ensure that these professionals and their patients are not left in limbo? Minister of Health. Well, thank you. We, uh, we recognize that many people will rely on the college to regulate traditional Chinese medicine practitioners. Four new public uh, members will be added to the board of the College of the Traditional Chinese Medicine Practitioners and Acupuncturists of Ontario, and upon approval, they should be able to uh, join the board by the end of this week. Next question, the member for York Centre. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Paying for partisan election ads with money of a political party is protected by freedom of expression, but running what are clearly partisan ads using taxpayer dollars undermines democracy. This Premier, who prides himself in respecting the taxpayer, is running taxpayer-funded government ads telling us that Ontario's economy is getting stronger eight weeks before an election. Not just on TV or radio. Order. I see them in my condo elevator. Of course, in 2018, the Premier campaigned against taxpayer-funded partisan ads. He attacked the Liberals on changing the rules. But indeed, the Premier turned out to be a Liberal. My question to the Premier, is it appropriate to use taxpayer dollars to advertise that our economy is getting stronger eight Order. weeks before an election? And to respond, Government House Leader. 
Mr. Speaker. I think the, the, really the, the problem that the member has over there is that uh, he's upset that the economy is getting stronger. He's upset of the investments that we're making across the province uh, of Ontario. So, look, we're just coming out of a very challenging pandemic, a pandemic, of course, that the member des de denies even exists, Mr. Speaker. And we are ensuring that the economy is back on track, and we're letting everybody know that the economy Order. is back on track. Look, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade just announced one of the biggest investments in Ontario history when it comes, when it comes to job creation. 2,500 new jobs, thousands of uh, additional jobs that will accompany this enormous investment, Mr. Speaker. And that's because of a strong, stable, progressive, conservative majority government, Mr. Speaker. Now, look, there will be an election, of course, uh, on, uh, on, June, on June the 2nd. Uh, I, uh, uh, I'm happy to hear that the member won't be running, uh, Mr. Speaker. I know he'll be busy on a leadership campaign. Uh, it is troubling that he uses uh, this, house, this House and the resources of this House to campaign federally. I suggest that he maybe should uh, not do that. But, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to make sure people understand. The supplementary question. Speaker, we went through a very serious pandemic, but also this government caused a mental health pandemic, an unemployment pandemic, an overdose pandemic, and missed cancer surgery pandemic, and, missed, and delayed surgeries pandemic. Speaker, voters are often upset that the House leader or ministers do not answer the actual question. I'd like to quote your predecessor who said, it's not called answer period, it's question period. When the House leader spins or does not answer my question, he tells the voters that he has no Order. answer. But when he makes it personal, especially Order. after the supplementary question, so I'm unable to respond, he demeans the voters of York Centre, the voters of Markham Stovall, all voters, and this Order. institution. The House leader consistently demonstrates that he's not just intellectually bankrupt, but he's a mean-spirited bull. Stop the clock. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Draw. Has he had 60 seconds? Has he had 60 seconds? No? Please conclude your response. Start the clock. But unlike the members of his caucus, I'm not afraid of him, so I'll ask him again. Why did the government why did the government break a promise to reform advertising rules and the member okay. the member will take a seat Does government house leader wish to reply <laughs> Well, that, that, that was a, a balanced question, wasn't it, uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker? Uh, uh, look, I, I'm, uh, I'm pretty confident that people of Markham Stovall uh, are, uh, are being represented well, Mr. Speaker, but ultimately, <laughs> ultimately, Mr. Speaker, I'm not afraid to put my name on the ballot on June the 2nd and let them pass judgment on whether I'm doing a good job or not, Mr. Speaker. I made a commitment to the people of Markham Stover to deliver, to deliver for them, and I think that's what I'm doing because I have all of these great colleagues behind me who are helping me deliver for the people of Markham Stover. I suggest the reason why the member got so personal over there is because he's maybe missing delivering what we can deliver. Yeah. But I tell you what, the people of his riding know that on June the 2nd, they'll finally have another member sitting with us on this side of the House, and we will continue to deliver for them, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue Response. to deliver for them. So I'll let them get all mean and nasty. What we'll continue to do is work on behalf of the people of the province of Ontario. Okay. The House will come to order. The next question, the member for Oxford. Very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the people of Oxford, I'd like to ask a question to the Minister of Infrastructure. Oh. Mr. Speaker, for too long, the people, businesses, and farmers in southwestern parts of the province have been without reliable internet connections they need for their day-to-day -day lives. Good question. Mr. Speaker, I have been paying attention to debates around Bill 93 to know that little has been said by the official opposition on high-speed internet in southwestern Ontario and they seem to be more concerned with connecting the province in northern regions. I know, unlike the opposition, our government is concerned with connecting all parts of the province and not just particular regions. Mr. Speaker, through you, would the Minister of Infrastructure tell us how this funding will benefit the people of southwestern Ontario? Oh, good question. The member for Brampton West. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Oxford that, for that wonderful question. Mr. Speaker, our government knows how critical access to high-speed internet is for families, businesses, and farmers alike, which is why we are investing nearly $4 billion to bring high-speed internet to every corner of the province by 2025, yeah. Mr. Speaker. This is the single largest investment by any province, by any government in the history of Canada, Mr. Speaker. Through our partnership with the federal government, we're bringing over six million to support high-speed internet connectivity to 1,191 homes and businesses across rural communities in Oxford County. Mr. Speaker, this will ensure that residents across the county have access to the reliable internet services they need to learn, work, and complete, compete in the marketplace and boost economies. This is just one of the ways our Spons. government is addressing the needs of our communities and supporting the people of southwestern Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to the supplementary question. Yeah. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the PA, to the Minister of Infrastructure, for that great response. It's great to be part of a government that is so dedicated to connecting Ontarians to critical infrastructure and building the province. This Funding will go a long way to improve the lives of my constituents and ensure that business owners and farmers have fair access to explore new markets, expand their services, and conduct their day-to-day -day business uh, with ease. I know our government has been working day in and day out to ensure our municipalities have the finances they need to support their residents. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, through you, would the Minister of Infrastructure please provide some additional information on how we are supporting the infrastructure needs in Oxford and in the great province of Ontario? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member is right to say that we are working diligently to build Ontario and support our local municipalities. In fact, in our fall economic statement, we doubled our OSIF contribution by $1 billion, bringing the total investment up to $2 billion over the next five years. Whoa. This funding will ensure our municipalities have the funding they need to repair and replace their critical infrastructure such as roads, bridges, wastewater, and drinking water systems. Mr. Speaker, through this funding, our government is providing over $8 million to support 206,000 residents in the Oxford district with safe and accessible public infrastructure. This includes over $5 million in funding for Oxford County and more than $1.2 million for the city of Woodstock. Mr. Speaker, by investing in these infrastructure projects, our government is saying yes to creating more jobs, saying yes to increasing economic growth, saying Response. yes to attracting more investments, and Mr. Speaker, saying yes to making our province communities the best place to live and grow. Yes. The next question, a member for Toronto St. Paul. Thank you, Speaker. My first question is for the Minister of Health. In 2019, my constituent, Margaret Loneska, was diagnosed with stage 4 metas metas metastatic uh, breast cancer. That same week, she also found out she was pregnant. Since then, Margaret has been prescribed a cocktail of treatments and medications, some of which are taken in clinic. Others are take home. Even with a patchwork of coverage, Margaret still pays over $10,000 per year for cancer treatment. Last year alone, it was $13,000, and she's got to take these for the rest of her life. She's not alone. This is the case for thousands of people diagnosed with cancer across Ontario, and without investment means they face a lifetime bill of hundreds of thousands of dollars to keep themselves alive and healthy. My question to the minister, while we, the Ontario NDP, have long called for 100 per cent coverage of take-home cancer care drugs, will this government finally say yes to publicly funded universal at-home cancer treatment so those diagnosed question. can live healthily without the financial burden? Burden attached. Thank you. Minister of Health. I thank the member very much for the question. I'm sorry to hear of Margaret's um, ill health. However, we do have provisions in Ontario for people who are unable to afford coverage or who do not have coverage programs under the Ontario Drug Benefit Program and under the Ontario Trillium uh, Foundation benefits that they can apply for to receive assistance in order to be able to pay for care for cancer or whatever other um, issue they're dealing with. Supplementary question. 
Thank you, Speaker. My second question is back to the Minister of Health. Given that breast cancer impacts predominantly women, the financial burden passed or faced by those diagnosed is even higher as they have yet to meet economic equality in this province of Ontario in 2022. This was made worse through the pandemic, which you know, Speaker, uh, disproportionately impacted women. Therefore, as we speak of an equitable recovery and a just recovery in this province, in the days coming up as we're waiting to see the spring budget, I am asking again my question to the Minister of Health, to the Premier, once again to the entire Conservative caucus, is will this government commit to 100 per cent universally funded uh, take-home cancer drugs to ensure that women and anyone who's experiencing cancer can survive, can be question. healthy without the financial burden. Will we see that in the spring budget? Thank you, Speaker. Minister Health. Well, thank you. Uh, we recognize that many people do have financial difficulties in paying for some of the drugs and medications that they need. However, we already do have programs for those people in Ontario under the Drug Benefit Program and under the Ontario Trillium Program. So to have universal coverage is not something that we are looking at right now. We may in the future. However, we do have that assistance in place for people who do need that assistance so that they will be able to ac access the medications that they need, uh, both now and in the future. The next question, the member for Glengarry, Prescott Russell. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, throughout this entire pandemic, the tourism sector has always been first to close and last to open. On September 27 of last year, the Minister for Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries touted the tourism recovery program to help Ontario's tourism industry. Now, six months later, not a single penny of the promised $100 million which is finally, uh, frankly, not, a, not even enough, has gone into any applicant's pocket despite being told that they should expect to start spending the, that money on April 1st. Mr. Speaker, will the minister guarantee that eligible applicants will receive the much-needed funds by April 1st? And to reply, the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Yes. Okay. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank uh, the minister for that, um, that answer, and I, have, uh, I trust that it is true. Um, Mr. Speaker, since 2003, long before this government came into power in 2018, tourism receipts in Ontario from overseas have increased by almost 183 per cent, and tourism receipts from the U.S. increased by a little over 27 per cent. And what does this government do? It cuts tourism funding in 2019. We here on this side of the legislature know the importance of supporting the tourist sector and now more than ever as many of its small businesses were affected by the pandemic. That's why we're offering a two-year tax holiday under our plan along with many other measures to support small businesses. Mr. Speaker, is this government going to support the tourist sector or is the plan to wait until enough businesses close so they're no longer Question. even eligible for help? Mr. Heritage. That's, that's a bit rich. The only people talking about tourism for the past two years in this legislature is the Progressive Conservative Party under the premiership of Doug Ford. I personally have done over 90 Order. announcements. I've held 44 Order. roundtables. I've done 162 tour stops, which is more than every single member in the opposition. the call. Member for York Centre will come to order. Restart the clock. I apologize for having to interrupt the Minister of Heritage. When I was bringing in the Ontario largest of its time building fund of $105 million, who voted against it? The Liberals. When I brought in the Reconnect Festival and Event Program and we brought it from $19 million to $50 million, who supported it? Progressive Conservatives. Who voted against it? When we brought forward the staycation tax credit of $270 million, who supported it? We did. Who voted against it? All right, I'll have another one. I, you know, we have this tourism recovery program that they have the audacity Response. to ask about $100 million. Who voted for it? We did. Who voted against it? They did. Mr. Speaker, I will take no lessons from an absent-minded opposition who has been focused on one thing and one thing only themselves, while this party has been focused on five and Order. The next question, the member for Whitby. 
Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Transportation. After four years as Transportation Minister, Stephen Del Duca did not get a single shovel into the ground on any new subway lines in the Greater Toronto Area. The Del Duca Wing Liberals were more Order. concerned, Speaker, about building bridges upside down and building unsuitable GO stations in Del Duca's own writing. The side of the House has to come to order. Member for Whitby has the floor. Thank you. Now, Speaker, Stephen Del Duca's inaction led to even more congestion and overcrowding. Member for Ottawa South, come to order. Member for Whitby has the floor. Thank you, Speaker. Stephen Del Duca's inaction led to even more congestion and overcrowding on the Young University line, where people, Speaker, were spending their commute packed in like sardines due to the previous decade of Liberal unwillingness to expand Toronto's transit. Speaker, with the Greater Toronto Area becoming home to another million people in the next 10 years, people need to get in and out of the downtown core so they can get to appointments, recreation, and of course, back home to their families. Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Transportation Question. please tell how this government is actually building transit for the Greater Toronto Area? Thank you. The Associate Minister of Transportation, GTA. Thank you, Speaker. That is an excellent member with an excellent question this morning. And I'm glad to let him know that while Sunday was cold, our spirits were warm because we broke ground on the Ontario Line at Exhibition Stadium. The Ontario Line is the crown jewel of our historic $28.5 billion transit expansion plan in the GTA, fulfilling our promise to deliver transit relief to Toronto's core. Stretching from Exhibition to Ontario Science Centre, the Ontario Line will stimulate $11 billion in the local economy, support over 4,700 jobs during the construction, cut crowding across Toronto's transit system, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 14,000 tonnes annually. Speaker, for 15 years, the Liberals and the NDP coalition said no to delivering any sort of transit relief for downtown on an overcrowded and antiquated subway. Subway system speaker. Finally, after decades of inaction from the opposition, our government is getting it done. Yeah. Yeah. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for your response and the terrific news for the people of the Greater Toronto area. Speaker, I'm pleased to hear of this game-changing progress from this government that will finally build transit for Toronto's downtown core. Speaker, while the Ontario Line presents a tremendous opportunity to expand transit, it needs to be built the right way, especially after 15 years of the Liberals and NDP twiddling their thumbs instead of getting shovels in the ground. Can the Associate Minister explain what this government is doing to ensure that this transit project will be built in a way that truly benefits our hard-working taxpayers? The Associate Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker. That's a valid concern from the member. Uh, Stephen Del Duca Liberals voted against our government's Getting Ontario Moving Act and Building Transit Faster Act. In other words, Speaker, the Liberals said no to building the Ontario line, no to reducing gridlock, no to community benefits, no to, re to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And, Speaker, they said no to getting people yes to from point A to point B. <laughs> then there's the NDP flipping and flopping like a barrel full of wet fish. The NDP demands more transit, more jobs, but the NDP said no to the Ontario line, no to keeping good— I'm just going to—OK. Okay. I'm going to caution the member on his language, ask him to complete his answer. Speaker. The NDP changes their minds a lot, and they say no to Canadian jobs, no to the Ontario line, no to keeping those good-paying jobs in Canada and in Thunder Bay because they just want 25 per cent Canadian content. Well, our government is moving forward with 75 per cent Canadian content in the Ontario line, 90 per cent of which will be made right here. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. In Niagara, one of the most concerning things we are seeing post-pandemic is that the quality of long-term care suffers because we are still in a full-blown staffing crisis. 
Premier, as you are aware, the councils on, on aging across Ontario point out that four hours of resident care per day is the single most important pillar to the transform long-term care and cannot wait until 2025. In fact, last October, the Family Council of Niagara Region's eight long-term care homes wrote to you about this. It included hundreds of signatures of residents and their families. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. We cannot keep ignoring the concerns from seniors, their families, and keep kicking four hours of care down the road to 2025. Will this government admit their plan for four hours of care is too long and commit to more immediate funding today? Government House Speaker. Well, sir, Mr. Speaker, uh, the, an the short answer is, is yes, because like in the member's own writing, I have actually committed to $20 million for more staff, Mr. Speaker. Now, now, unfortunately for the people in her community, she voted yes. against that, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure you're, you're, you're as concerned as I am that, that the member would vote against that. Now, it's not just about staffing, obviously, Mr. Speaker, because one of the things we did here as well is that they need new, more modern facilities, and that is, would help. So I actually announced uh, uh, a new allocation of 13 new beds and 226 upgraded beds in a brand wow. new facility. That's Wait good. for it. Wait for it. In the member's writing, oh. and the member voted against it, Mr. Oh. Speaker. The member voted against it. So I'm not going to listen to the member. And you know what? I'm going to continue to provide more funding for long-term care thanks to this caucus, thanks to this premier, and thanks to a strong, stable, progressive, conservative majority government. We'll be doing it well into the future. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. May I remind the Minister, though, that, uh, or the Deputy House Leader, that beds don't operate on their own. They need people to operate them. I'm hearing about these resignations by handful that come across the desks of long-term care homes every day in Niagara. These are professionals that got into this work because they love their jobs, the seniors they care for, and families to them. They are families to them. However, they are burnt out. Melissa Mathens, the president of Niagara QP Local, is someone with 18 years' experience as a PSW. She has an offer to this government. Come down and do it for one day in Niagara. Because if you are not front-loading four hours of care, then you are not fixing the long-term care for seniors. Through you, Speaker, to the Premier, Will you take up this offer and come to Niagara for one day and let our frontline staff in Niagara show you why your plan is moving way, is not moving fast enough and is way too slow? Governor uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, now we knew back in 2018 before we actually took government that we had to make investments in long-term care. Unlike the NDP, who held the balance of power between 2011 and 2014 and didn't make it a priority, before we were even elected, we said we had to make it a priority. That's why we said we were going to build 30,000 new long-term care beds, upgrade an additional uh, uh, 28,000, Mr. Speaker. We've made the commitment to move to four hours of care. And we're not just making the commitment like we hear so often from the, the members opposite, we're actually putting dollars behind it. That's right. Now, I've talked Order. about the $20 million in the members' own riding, but it's 78 million dollars for Niagara. 78 million dollars for more staffing in Niagara. Speaker. That is Member an incredible Catherine amount of funding orders. and it's not it's not something that we should look, we're providing the funding but it's people's Spots. money. But you know why we're doing that Mr. Speaker because the people who helped build this province deserve a better quality of care, better than they got from the Liberals, better than they got from the NDP Liberal coalition and we will deliver it Mr. Speaker for them and for all of you. Okay, the next question, the member for York Centre. Question to the Minister of Children and Social Services. Autism Awareness Month begins this weekend. One of the most shameful legacies of this government is the handling of children with autism. Lives of tens of thousands of children could have been significantly improved with evidence-based treatment, but the government froze the 23,000 waitlist in early 
fall 2018 and then decimated the Ontario Autism Program, the OAP. It retreated under pressure, but because of politics, failed to adopt my autism plan, which was in fact endorsed by the Ontario Autism Coalition. Instead of paying for Order. treatment and moving with the list, for almost four years this government has been consulting and working to get it right. Four years to get it right. Meanwhile, we have a lost generation of children with autism. The government pays for trampolines and bureaucrats they call coordinators, but four years later they still refuse or are unable to pay for needs-based treatment. Will the minister Question. explain how is it that we still do not have a functioning Ontario autism program? Respond, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Order. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Our government is absolutely committed to making sure that children with special needs and with autism receive the supports that they need, and that's exactly why we doubled the funding. Uh, from 300 million to 600 million. The previous government did not address the capacity needed to create the programs necessary for the children to receive their care. That's why we have provided capacity grants to enable the, the providers to be there to provide Order. the service for, the, for these children. That's why we have five times as many children enrolled in a multi pathway, comprehensive, needs based system for our children with uh, autism in this province. And that's why we've invested invested in the uh, advisory uh, um, panel in the integrated intake Response. organization that will respond to the need with care coordinators. This is beyond anything the Liberals ever did. They talked a lot, but they didn't provide the services. The supplementary. Care coordinators do not provide treatment. They bounce families around. Speaker, only this government could double the budget and deliver less services. It's their version of efficiencies. It would be funny if it wasn't so tragic for so many families and so many children. Paying for treatment is not just the right thing to do because it can materially improve the life of a child. It's also the fiscally prudent thing to do because you save on support programs down the road. Four years later, and we have 600 kids in a pilot program. That's it. The Premier said that autism families would not have to protest on the front lawn. So why did the wait list more than double from 23,000 to 55,000 children? And when can families expect a functioning, needs-based Ontario autism program? When? Member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. The response, Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. To the member opposite, we are in fact on track. We have approximately 40,000 children that are receiving multiple, uh, multiple services. And the opposition, Mr. Speaker, had the chance to support children with special mm -hmm. needs and with autism, and they said no. no. They said no to the children who will be served by the, Grand, uh, the Grandview Children's Treatment Centre in Ajax, and they said no to the children who will be served by the Chatham-Kent Children's Treatment Centre and their families, and they said no to the children who were served by the One Door for Care at Chios Integrated Treatment Centre in Ottawa. They said no over and over and over again, and they voted against the largest investment to support children with special needs, including autism, in two decades. They voted against these investments not once, but in two budgets, Mr. Speaker. Our government is committed to supporting children with special Spons. needs. We are putting programs behind uh, our talk, much more so than the previous government ever did, leaving children languishing on the list with no hope of ever receiving the care. Member for York Centre, come to order. And the minister will conclude her answer. And thank you very much. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. It was recently became uh, public news through a CBC article that the government is working on a plan to sell clean energy credits to companies wanting to lower their carbon footprint, but environmental groups say this would do nothing to reduce Ontario's carbon dioxide emissions. Brian Purcell, the VP of Policy and Programs for the Atmospheric Fund, said of the plan, and I quote, whether they know it or not, companies would be buying a credit that does nothing to reduce actual emissions in real life and just simply allows them to claim a lower carbon footprint. Uh, this pretty much sounds consistent with this government. Uh, their overall approach to tackling climate change, allowing it to spin out of control without having the courage to actually address its root causes. Uh, they go on to say that this plan has, and I quote, fundamental flaws that undermine any environmental benefit. Speaker, can the Premier or the Minister just admit that this is a scheme to make companies feel better about their carbon footprint rather than putting Question. in place real incentives to reduce it? 
Minister of Energy to respond. Thanks very much, Speaker. I'm glad I got to stick around and answer this question this morning. Uh, thanks to the member opposite as well. Uh, when it comes to the Clean Energy Credit Program, Mr. Speaker, this is a voluntary registry that's been created. Unlike what the previous Liberal government created and what was supported uh, by the previous uh, NDP third party, uh, it was a cap-and-trade program, which was actually a carbon tax by another name, that was driving businesses out of our province, Mr. Speaker. The Liberals didn't do much right when they were in power. But one thing they did do when they created the Green Energy Act, Mr. Speaker, was allow for credits to be sold to companies that wanted to purchase them. Now, they never acted on that, which would have been the smart thing to do, but we're doing that, Mr. Speaker. And what we're going to do is allow these Response. companies to voluntarily purchase the credits, and then we'll get the money for that, Mr. Speaker, which we're returning to the customers so their electricity bills will be lower. Doesn't that make perfect sense, Mr. Speaker? It took a Conservative government to figure it out, though. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. I'm glad you got to stick around too for that answer because actually you're going to be driving up carbon emissions. Your plan is actually worse than the Liberal plan. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker uh, I would expect nothing less than a response like this from the government. This is a government that wasted $30 million on a failed Supreme Court challenge over the federal government's carbon tax. They slashed funding for Indigenous conservation efforts and significant environmental initiatives. This is a government that don't even follow the province's own environmental bill of of rights. Lana Goldberg, the climate program manager at the Environmental Defence, has also dismissed this credit system, stating that, and I quote, it allows companies to claim credit for existing clean electricity generation resources instead of actually greening their own power consumption. Given the scale of the climate crisis in this province, in this country, in the world, we need real action. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier or this minister be upfront with the Ontarians that this program could, would only enable Question. businesses to further greenwash their practices rather than help them reduce their dependency on the gas and gas powered electricity? Come clean with the people of this province. Mr. Benji. Thank you very much, and I will, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is a voluntary credit, a clean energy credit that's been created, Mr. Speaker. But when it comes to actually making a difference for our environment, Speaker, our government is doing that. Our government is bringing in concrete measures that aren't only going to clean up the environment here in Ontario, but they're going to make a difference around the world, Mr. Speaker. That's why yesterday I was in Regina with ministers from Alberta, New Brunswick, and Saskatchewan talking about our small modular reactor strategic plan that is going to allow us to send emissions-free, reliable power sources to jurisdictions around the world, Mr. Speaker, to help them reduce their emissions, to make the transition oh. from coal-fired generation oh. to clean, reliable, affordable nuclear energy, Mr. Response. Speaker. We're also electrifying places like Defasco and Algoma Steel, some of the biggest emitters in our province. We're making tangible differences to our environment, not just blah, blah, blah. Like Thank you. Next question, member for Scarborough Goldwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community, Children, Community and Social Services. Last week, I visited the home of Priyanka Iqbal, a mother with two young autistic children. Priyanka explained that this Ford government's interim one-time funding is not nearly enough for her children to receive the critical core services which are essential for their early development, like what was available under the former Liberal plan, which was co-created by advocates and families with autism. With her young daughters on the waitlist for the needs-based program, along with over 50,000 other children in Ontario, Priyanka has been told by the ministry that only 8,000 spots will be opening in fall of 2022, but there are no guarantees for her children. Speaker, the Ontario Autism Program was created to reduce the wait list, yet it has done the opposite. The new needs-based program was supposed to be implemented in April of 2020. It has then been rescheduled for April of 2021, and we are now April 2022, and we are still waiting for this implementation. When will the government stop making Ontario families wait? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. You know, I'd like to give you a breakdown of the 40,000 children that are already receiving services under our Ontario Autism Program that is a multi-pathway a plan that provides multiple services, a far more broader and comprehensive program than ever before. This is a world-leading program that has resulted from extensive consultations, even during COVID, uh, to understand exactly what families needed and what children needed and the importance of early intervention, the importance of physiotherapy, uh, behavioral therapy, uh, um, language therapy, mental health supports, a much more broader program. So 400,000 uh, children are receiving supports through this program right now. We are making good progress and we are on track, Question. as we said we would before. 32,000 children with that one-time term, one -time interim funding, 3,665 in the behavioural plans. Uh, 30, uh, uh, Thank, you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Speaker. This minister understands the importance of early intervention. She just said it. Priyanka and her family are watching, and they are seeing the opportunity drain. Both of their children are under three, yet the support and the help that they need is simply not available. In the cases of, of the situation with families like the Iqbals, parents are afraid. They are doing everything that they can to provide the support to their children. They are selling their assets. They are doing everything possible. Yet under your government, even though you say the funding has doubled, it has not flowed to the needs of these families. This program is not functioning, Minister. And these children are waiting and their window of opportunity is closing Question. and their families are afraid. So will the minister commit today with the timeline, frankly, so that parents like the Iqbals can know when they will be registering and getting their children the Thank you. Thank you. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and, and again, thank you. And I, I certainly want to express how heartfelt this effort is by our government. Uh, over 40,000 children receiving services right now, five times as many children than under the program from the previous government. Here, here. That is a very important accomplishment. The process that was required to understand the needs of the families, to listen to them, to hear them, uh, it has required some time. But we are making important progress with the independent intake organization. We absolutely understand the critical, the critical Order. piece of this. And again, I will, I will talk about the 12,914 families who are receiving foundational family services. The for Scarborough, Guildwood will come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. The minister will conclude her answer. Thank you, Speaker. My, my heart goes out to all the parents, especially under the previous program, that had no chance of getting any program. Thank you very much. The next question, Member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, among other things, this government has a negative reputation for secrecy, for lack of transparency, and for wasting public dollars on useless fights in the courts. The most recent example of all three is this Premier's decision to fight the release of his own mandate letters to his cabinet ministers. He has fought and lost court battle after court battle to release these 150 50 pages of mandate letters. In January, the Ontario Court of Appeal directed him to have those letters released by now. Why is this government speaker wasting even more public dollars to take his hidden mandate letters to Canada's Supreme Court instead of just releasing them? What is he trying to hide? I'm surprised to hear that from the member opposite, to be honest with you. I'm a little disappointed, Mr. Speaker. I mean, I, I thought when she, she deposited that motion that I was being and the government was being too bipartisan, that we were working too hard to work together, that I thought that was that, uh, that bridge building that we have been trying so hard to develop here, a parliament that works closely uh, together. So I, I'm very surprised to hear that uh, uh, from, from, uh, from the member. I mean, it is the same opposition, of course, that, that deposited a, a motion of confidence in the government, Speaker, and then 
voted unanimously to support the government, and not only to support us, but to beg us to continue in, in office, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, uh, look, uh, as I said on, uh, on a number of occasions, I think the mandate has been very clear for all of us, not only the cabinet members, the parliamentary assistants, the caucus members. It is to grow the economy, uh, create the best possible province for people to live, work, invest, and to raise a family in. And I think a strong, stable, progressive, conservative majority government has delivered that. And on June the 2nd, we will continue to deliver that for the people of the province. That concludes our question period for today. Next, we have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 100, an act to enact legislation to protect access to certain transportation infrastructure. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.